Hello, everyone. Welcome to the series Mud Talks, Going Rogue in Grad School Business or Law After a Mud Degree with Russell Hamilton, Class of 94, and Mark Matheson, Class of 94. My name is Vanessa Chu, Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations. We thank you for attending today's event, and we hope you and your family are well. This talk is being recorded and we will be, distrib will be distributed. <coughs> Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, and we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Russell and Mark to introduce themselves. Take it away, Russell. Hi there. I'm using my radio announcer voice. Um, I'm Russell Hamilton, class of 94, and uh, we're going to talk to you about pesky graduate degrees that you might want to do that are off, far afield of the normal tried and true science and engineering way. And I am joined by my lovely and talented co-host. Mark Matheson here. I'm, I'm trying to share screens. And let me get this going here. All right. So, you know, business versus law. What should you do if you're thinking about a professional degree after MUD? Russell has the MBA and I have the law degree. So Russell, go ahead and uh, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself and your time at MUD. Well, both of us share um, the Barnstormer Club. Hopefully that's still around where, uh, you know, you go, you know, folks that are interested in aviation happen. I'm actually the co-founder of the club. Yeah, it's, uh, it goes back that far. Uh, and <laughs> I did uh, engineering and uh, started out in West and, went went up to south and then all the way out to lind which at the time was the furthest out dorm and uh before the for those of you who are are or were engineering majors uh, you might have heard of tau beta pi i actually helped uh start the uh the predecessor to that honors club which we called mu delta delta because you have to have your own club uh before uh you can make it a tau beta pi chapter little little unknown history mark Right. I, so I attended uh, Atwood. It's hard for me to say the word Atwood dorm. We just called it New Dorm. <laughs> and um, even though New, uh, what was it, Case Dorm and then Lynn Dorm were built after New Dorm, everybody called it New Dorm. And going back to Mud, at least a decade after that, people were still calling New Dorm or Atwood New Dorm. So I apologize, but I, I came from New Dorm. But for one year, I, I was in North Dorm. Great year. Again, part of Barnstormers and um, part of the aviation at mind. Let's go to the next one here. So this, we went through our pictures and found the stuff that my parents had taken and, and I had taken on the day of our graduation back uh, in uh, June in 1994. And because back then you only had film cameras. You only had film cameras. <laughs> And I, you know, going through all the pictures, it wasn't a lot of pictures because just digital cameras were very rare back then. And, um, and we had film cameras and I was kind of cheap. I only pulled out the camera for a few events and graduation was one of them. And there was maybe one or two other things, but um, you know, this is it. So there we are, it's a sweltering day. And um, don't know where you are, Russell, probably one of the tall people in the back. And there's Henry Riggs. You know, the guy with the bow tie, they'd wheel out and he would give a great speech and for, you know, for every big function, Henry Riggs would, would do something. So there he is. He and was our Maria Chloe. So oh, yeah. for those of you who, he was a couple of presidents ago. Let's go to the next one here. And we're all walking. I'm part of the M's here. So you can see me. There's uh, you know Cliff in the background. There's Josh Mann. If you guys are watching this or watching this someday, I give a shout out to you. And, um, and there we are, uh, there I am going up to go see um, President Riggs and there's Cliff McCarthy and all the M's are all lined up, We're ready to go get our diplomas. Let's go do something with our lives. I point out Cliff because there he is again. And you know, I saw him recently and he looks exactly the same. Some of us have not aged at all and Cliff is one of them. Now, the rest of us not so lucky um but there we yeah, are you'll walking. see you'll see photos of us back in the day in a minute and you'll see how much uh, each of us have aged <laughs> uh, there we go photo was taken okay well, what are you gonna do with your life well i you know i taken off the robe and was there with my parents and they took this snapshot of me looking clueless and this is just 
perfect for this occasion here. Go ahead, Russ. So um, we know you didn't just dial in here to see our graduation photos, although they are good. Um, what, uh, what have our classmates gone on to do from 1994 until now? Now, both uh, Mark and I are in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. So, you know, that might skew sort of our sample of people that we've uh, kept in touch with. But it's been, you know, a lot of sort of STEM related things that you would imagine, you know, engineering, chemistry, some startups, some people went the academic route, you know, engineering or chemistry professors. I know a guy that's uh, in uh, satellites and uh, some people even oh, use mud for pre-med <laughs> for, uh, for being doctors. Yeah, and this is not by no means a comprehensive list. People just did all sorts of, of interesting, cool things. Some STEM, some not. So this is the non-deviant path, you know, what, what could happen to you if you stay on the straight and narrow? Yeah, speaking of straight and narrow, what was going on in this photo? Russ. So, so I didn't have many photos of me at MUD either, but, uh, you know, I wanted to do something that had the concrete blocks in the background. So you can see uh, how I've changed from my pirate self to, uh, to now. So what I did um, when I graduated from MUD was um, I went into environmental engineering. I got a master's at UC Berkeley and uh, went to a engineering consulting firm up in the Bay Area for four years, got a PE. And what I found while I was going around uh, cleaning up hazardous waste sites like uh, refineries and other things was that a lot of the engineers um, and, uh, you know, I'd propose solutions or something. And, you know, so I'm an engineer proposing them to other engineers at the clients who then go and talk back to headquarters. And the MBAs who are back at headquarters would then tell the engineers, no, you know, yes, no, or here's how you want to do something. So I thought, well, I want to uh, be able to talk the same language as the people in headquarters. So I'll, uh, I'll go and I'll get an MBA. And so I did, I went to Stanford, you know, again, not leaving the Bay Area. And uh, after that, I did uh, management consulting. I, uh, and then I went to three financial services firms, American Express, Visa, and Wells Fargo. And now uh, for the last two years or so, I've been a part-time uh, independent consultant. I Financial services, we just, the rest of us just call those credit card companies and banks. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So I'm, this is me. We've already talked about what dorm I went through, but after MUD, I knew exactly what I was going to do. I was going to go get a PhD in aeronautical engineering, and I went to the University of Washington. But before you get into the PhD program at the University of Washington, you have to get a master's first. So I went and got my master's and then went into the PhD program there. And for the PhD program, you essentially do another master's plus a dissertation and there's some other stuff too. So I went through orals and writtens and you know, all, all the classwork, all the TA stuff, everything to do it. And then there was the dissertation. And um, a long story short, I decided to quit that all because other people were making so much money out in the market. It was 1997-ish you know, time. And so I needed to go off and do something. I was a little bit tired of school. So I was in Seattle at the time and I moved to Massachusetts to get out of the bad weather of Seattle. <laughs> I learned about the bad weather in Massachusetts at Raytheon, but I had a great time, I had a great time there. And um, at, over the years, we'll talk about this a little bit later. I, I earned a PE right before I went to law school. And in 04, I went to law school at UCLA and then graduated, went to work for a, a small practitioner and then went to my current firm, which I've been working at for about 13 years or so. So let's go over the career timelines. Go ahead, Russell. You know, we just wanted to make sure you all knew that we, we could still do things sort of engineering-y. So we've got a Gantt chart of our, uh, our lives here. So this was, uh, this was me with uh, my, I did a one-year master's, uh, then my time, my four years in environmental work, and then uh, two years with the MBA. Um, and then this has been the next many years since then of <laughs> going through between consulting um, and the various banks and card firms. While I was doing management consulting, I tended to work for either uh, consumer products or um, uh, 
financial services types of firms. And so it was, I guess, sort of natural. I would go on into one of those. And um, in case those of you that are still students are wondering how um, some of these, uh, these job transitions happen, you know, one of the supposed reasons for getting an MBA is the network. You know, you, uh, you now know this, this group of classmates who can help you get jobs. It's, it's who you know, right? Yeah. It's true, I, right? Yeah, I never got a job that way. I always got my jobs from people I had already worked with. So like one of my friends who had been at a consult, the consulting firm, then went to the credit card company. And then the same thing happened when I went from American Express over to Visa. So go figure. Hmm. How about you, Mark? So zero, you know, that those pictures a few slides ago, that was zero, Mark. And I went to graduate school, UW. So I put the colors in here, two years and then went to a defense contractor, that's Raytheon. And I went for nine years um, from post, wait, no, from Harvey Mudd all the way to, to um, the end of my career there. I, there was one question that we had, I'm gonna jump ahead to the question, which is, would you do anything differently? And the thing I would do differently would be to change this nine here into more of a, a seven, a six or a seven. At, at Raytheon, I worked with this guy, his, I went rock climbed with it. He and Thomas Chong, if anybody remembers, remembers him from the class of 94. So the three of us and more people would go and rock climb all the time. And, and this guy, Sean, would say, after five years of being at Raytheon, I'm going to quit. And I'm not going to work here anymore because I don't want to get comfortable in this job. And so when the five-year mark comes around, he quit. And we all had good jobs. And I was kind of wondering, like, why are you quitting this great job and, and everything? He went out and climbed other places and probably traveled the world. Um, but uh, and he, he did it. Now, five years seemed a little bit soon. And, and Russell, I noticed you're five years, too. It seems a little bit soon. We were still learning our job, still, like, getting up in management, still kind of, you know, testing the waters of a, a future career. For me, it probably would have been more comfortable about you know, six or seven years to say, okay, I've done this. I'm not going to learn anything more engineering wise. If I go into management, then I'm losing a lot. So, you know, what should I do? Well, I waited till, till nine years. And then I went to law school. That's three years. I went to um, a solo practitioners for a year. I was working for him in, during law school. And then I went to the large law firm that I'm at right now. So um, if I had to do everything all over again, I would scoot mine, my Gantt chart over to the left a little bit and be more, more like Russell. That's the lesson, kids. Be more like me. So, oh, you want to hear more about me? Well, let's talk about me some more. So I'm Mr. MBA here. Um, and some of you might, you know, we we're trying, we we're trying to pitch this uh, informative talk to people along the spectrum of curiosity. So some people might not really even know what an MBA is uh, or a law degree. Some people might be already trying to get one. So we've got something for everyone in here. Uh, so bear with us if you already know this. What is an MBA? It's a two-year degree. Um, you can also spread it out even longer if you would like. There's a lot of part-time programs that you can do on top of your day job. Uh, so you know, what do you want to do after the end of the day at a full-time job? Go to your other job. Go do your uh, part-time work on top of that. Um, you can tell which way I'm bi biased. I like the, uh, you know, stop working and do a two-year degree, but it's definitely more expensive. Um, the time that I did it is about when people tend to do it. So uh, you tend to do it uh, about, you know, three or four years after your bachelor's, but some do less, some do more. And you study accounting, economics, marketing, strategy, finance, entrepreneurship, a lot of things. And the way that you do it is the case method. So Russell is at a dark and stormy night. He has a management meeting the next morning where he must chart the strategy of the company. Will they go into the new product sector A or will they stay in their current one? What should we do? And so you, uh, you read the case, you, you scribble down some notes, and then in the case discussion, um, the, uh, the professor will sort of guide a, uh, you know, a group discussion where everybody gives their thoughts. Yeah, I think we should go into this new product or no, and here's why, things like that. 
And some people don't have quantitative skills. So um, a lot of, you'll notice that a number of these topics are actually kind of quantitative. The furthest you get is calculus though, in, in the actual quantitativeness of it. So, you know, you will have something of an advantage on sort of the more uh, quantitative side of stuff. You know, those delta epsilon proofs come in handy, right? Yeah. And so, you know, we gave the, um, the list of what our small sample set of people we know did out of mud. Here's, here's another small sample set uh, out of what I know from my friends that are fellow Stanford MBAs from who graduated 20 years ago now. So they've, uh, the, first, uh, the first several you'll notice are very similar to what you saw before. And again, probably skewed for, for us Bay Area types, uh, you know, tech, biotech, startups. Management consulting, that's, um, that was one of the things that I did when I said I was uh, doing consulting, that you tend to need an MBA more for more than some of these others. People have gone into private equity, venture capital, and, it's, and uh, a thing that's important to note about MBAs is it gives you management and leadership uh, training, not just for the world of business, but you can apply that to uh, nonprofits or governments as well. There are some special management programs for nonprofits, notably the Kennedy School in, um, out of uh, Harvard, uh, but uh, you know, you can take a regular MBA and do that too, if uh, you know, you've got that sort of interest. So uh, let's say that you're, you know, in some of these questions, uh, we're seeing the questions in the Q&A as, uh, as they've been uh, coming. You know, some questions that we got uh, ahead of time were about, you know, help, uh, help us, you know, weigh the costs and benefits of these. So one of them is just the, uh, the opportunity cost. It's a lot of money and it's a lot of time in order to uh, to do these MBAs. However, eh, so, and especially for an MBA, not so much for the law degree, you don't actually need it, right? You can still do business stuff without an MBA. You know, you can just go ahead and do it. You don't, you know, it's not a required degree for just about most things. Again, with the exceptions of some things like uh, um, the management consulting, where it seems like most people do have MBAs. And it's always hard to get into the good schools. And especially uh, if, as you know, as um, we see in the chat, you know, you've got uh, typical mud grades on, uh, on your transcript. So we'll talk about that more in the Q&A section. Yeah. On the pros side, two years off of work is two years off of work. I mean, that, that was nice to me. Um, it's a great group of people to know, even if you don't get your jobs through them. Um, and, uh, if you really are going to go into a uh, business type of fields, you know, it's nice to get a little more background in the business rather than being, um, you know, a, a STEM person going, uh, sort of straight into it. It's nice to get a little extra training, uh, especially if you're having trouble making those changes. So for me, uh, when, um, when I, uh, you know, if you remember back to uh, my timeline, I did consulting right after my MBA. I actually tried to go into management consulting before I got an MBA. And uh, because sometimes they take people with just graduate degrees, and I already had a graduate degree, even though it was in engineering. And I tried to do their case interviews, and I tried to talk business, and I basically got the advice, you know, you're a nice, smart guy, but you don't really know much about business. Go get an MBA and then come back to us. So, you know, it does help. At least they, they called you a smart guy. <laughs> yeah. Smart. And then I had mentioned this where, um, like, the classwork won't be a challenge for anybody that can uh, get through mud. So let's say that you've decided that you do want an MBA. Um, how do you... How do you get in, especially back to that point that, uh, you know, the better schools are challenging. So um, this is easy for me to say, right? Have an impressive first few years of work experience. Well, um, how do you do that? Well, you know, you can, you can be a non-traditional candidate like me. There weren't that many people that were working on hazardous waste sites uh, that applied to, uh, to Stanford. Um, or you can, you know, if you, if you have it in mind, if you're early in your career and you still have a couple of years before you think you want to get an MBA, you can try to um, volunteer for these kind of work assignments that might look uh, like particularly interesting to the admissions people. 
and can showcase your talents. Um, and when you're actually doing the application, um, think of the full story that you want to tell. So, you know, I, for me, you know, I'm a person with an environmental background who wants to go off, you know, into the world of business and accomplish these, these kind of things. You don't want to tell that same story three times. You want to chunk that up into three things and you, t you tell part of it in your essay. You have your recommender number one tell the next chunk and recommender number two tell the next chunk so that when they see the complete application, you get to tell the rich tapestry of your full experience and um, not be like repetitive on just a few points. Speaking of those recommenders, um, again, this is if you have, you know, a while to think and plot your course about it. Um, reach out to them early and talk to them about it. You know, if you're at a job now where you'll want to leave that job in a year or two, you know, it's always dicey to share this kind of intentions with somebody. But particularly if you can find somebody who has an MBA and even better from that school, and if you can in confidence tell them that you'd eventually like to go to their alma mater, um, that can really help, you know, because you, you can they might be able to provide you some specific advice to your situation, and then they'll be even that much better of a recommender, you know, down the road. Um, just like when you applied to MUD, um, be able to talk about why you want to go there. You know, all of the different schools have a different, it's pretty easy to tell what the schools think about themselves from their own materials. You know, we're a great school for people in finance or people who want to do marketing. Um, you know, a number of the schools are known for different things. So don't, in your application, don't just say, I want a generic MBA because I want to do these things. You know, say, I specifically want an MBA from this school because it will help me in this thing, and you know, and then sort of a logical path down. And that leads to me. So with my law degree, um, I'm still trying to figure out how did I get here? And um, before I get into what does law school entail, I'll tell a little bit of, of my story. I had different people over the years when I was an engineer tell me, oh, Mark, you'd make a good lawyer. And I took that as people just putting me down, frankly. <laughs> and at some point I, I put two and two together. I mean, there was people that didn't know each other and, um, and it would typically be after a presentation of mine or something. And I'd tell, you know, management, this is why we broke the equipment. This is why we're over budget, why we need a new piece of equipment, why we're late. And they would say, that's great. Why don't you tell our client that so we can get the money? And so I'd end up in these presentations and then there'd be somebody in the audience, you know, Mark, you'd make a good lawyer. So I think it was just because I could speak a little bit better than a lot of my peers, but um, it might have been just I was able to articulate what was wrong and put it in different words for somebody else. And um, so what I did was I um, just kind of had the feeling in my head and I, I drove by a school and it had free LSAT. The LSAT is the law school admissions test and they just had an offering of free LSAT. Take the LSAT for free. Well, it's free. All I have to do is sit there for, I don't know, three hours or whatever and take a test and figure out if I'm going to change my life. So that's what I did. And I did phenomenally well. And then I decided, you know what, I bet I can just study for this and maybe do even better. I, you know, maybe ace it, who knows? And so I went and took the real LSAT test and did pretty well. I didn't ace it, but um, I did pretty well or well enough to get into someplace good. So what does law school entail? First thing take the LSAT. It's a three-year degree, full-time, uh, four years if it's part-time. Now, three years is what like most of the top-tier law school programs require. There's no part-time. So at Stanford, Yale, um, those others, they're all, you know, UCLA, they're all three years. There's no part-time. And um, other tiers of schools, you can do the part-time, you can do it at night. And so um, you get some very quality candidates who just, they have a wife and kids and mortgages and all that, and they cannot do a full, just encompassing three years. So they go into another program. So it's three or four years. And it's 
I found it's typically the typical student has been out of law school, uh, out of undergrad for about one year. And there were a few people who went straight through. They finished their undergrad and then went straight to law school. But me, I had been out for nine years. And so I was actually a rare species and I had a STEM degree. So it was, um, I, you know, I got to tell my story to the admissions office of why I want to get in to, uh, to UCLA or the other schools I applied to. So I was surrounded by 23 year olds. It was, a, it was the great, it was a great experience. Subjects include all the ones, civil procedure contracts and con law and, and all these others. If you ever watch the paper chase, you get a little bit of a feeling for how it is. I, you know, people complain there's too many lawyers in the world or there's too many lawyers in the United States. And I would like to say there's a few subjects if we just taught them in the undergrad or in high school, we wouldn't need so many lawyers. And I've highlighted them here. Contracts, like how to interpret a contract. It, you know, contracts are everywhere. You have a bunch of contracts, whether it's your cell phone bill or, 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 or at Harvey Mudd College, there's a contract that, that covers you. Evidence may seem esoteric, but it drives so much behavior. Evidence of what is hearsay, what gets into court, what could people put against you, what, what words could be used against you, all that leads so much behavior and how our society is structured, really. So I think that's really important. Business associations, that's a class where you learn a lot about business. What's the difference between a, an S Corp, a C Corp, and, and an LLP, and why you never form a partnership with somebody, a straight partnership with somebody. And then legal writing. I put IRAC down here. IRAC stands for issue, rule, analysis, conclusion. And this is how all lawyers are trained to write out their whatever they're trying to do. You state the issue, you state the rule, the statute, the whatever it is, appeal to equity, and then you analyze it and then you conclude. Very simple, but that's how we're all trained to do it. And because we're all trained to do it, that's what we expect. And if we don't get that from other people, we kind of become annoyed because we're lawyers. Instruction is not by the case method. Instruction is by the Socratic method. So typically you show up to class, and everybody's read hundreds of pages, hundreds of pages each night. That is by no means a hyperbole, hundreds of pages, uh, sometimes hundreds of pages for each class. And then a professor will call on you and ask you to state the, you know, what happened in this case. And, and I've actually been in a class where a, a friend of mine stated the case and stated what they were supposed to do to a certain extent, but had not read the footnotes. And so the professor said, Thank you, Miss such and such, for showing us why it's very important to read the footnotes when we're reading these cases. And, and remember, it's hundreds of pages, and you got to read the footnotes too. So that's kind of what you're called out to do. And then the professor will rarely say what their mind is and and how they would come out with something. They'll call on different students in the class to debate and argue, and sometimes they'll have you. Um, argue for one side and then switch and argue for the other side. So it's a um, contrast. It's, it's very contrasting in, in what you do there from the case study. And unlike mud, just about everyone is bad at math by their own admission. In fact, I mean, they're very, very talented people, but um, people will say they were afraid of math. And they were so afraid of math, they didn't even want to be a doctor because you know there's chemistry in that and there's math and they just didn't want to go through that. So they know that if you can't do math and you're afraid, a little bit afraid of STEM subjects, your, your opportunity in life is very limited. You know? And so what can you do? Well, you go to law school. And so you're surrounded by these people who are not good at math, who say they're not good at math. So the example careers of my classmates from UCLA Law are you know, listed right here. The top three, big law, small and mid-size, and then solo practitioners. Those are just lawyers working for themselves, working for you know, firms. You do lawyering, you know, you've seen that on TV. Then there's these corporate lawyers. So all these glass offices that are all over at you know, Apple and Cisco and you know, wherever you go, there's office buildings. Well, who's in those office buildings that are all full of engineers and lawyers. 
you know, engineers like this stem cell that can do all sorts of things like, you know, code or make a new product or build things. And a lawyer is similar to that, but for, you know, figuring out the contracts and the licensing and the, the this and the that, all the relationships that need to be, to be made. So um, there's a lot of people who go into corporate work. You can also go into nonprofits. Um, they, I, I could never afford to do that. I thought I could never afford to do that, but lots of people who are able to graduate from law school with all that debt are able to pay it off somehow and work at a nonprofit. Same with government. And there are some people who went into politics, actually. It's, it's quite um, appealing on a certain level. So the cons, it's three years off of work or four years if you're part-time. And I guess if you're going part-time, you, you could still work a little bit and pay off a mortgage or, or pay for other things. It's, it was quite expensive. Um, I was gonna add up whatever it was for me, but it has no bearing on, on anybody now. You just go look it up. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's extraordinarily time consuming, at least from the three year part. I mean, there's no other part of your life. I'd go into the library right when it opened and I'd go to classes during the day and stay in the library all the way until it closed. And so were a lot of my, my roommate and my classmates as well, all consuming. And what that does is it wrecks relationships. I can only think of one couple who, um, who stayed together, a husband, wife who stayed together. Everyone else you know, over the years got divorced. I mean, their girlfriends and boyfriends, they're gone. They, people just don't understand how all consuming it is. And you're hanging out with this other group of people all day. So if you want a divorce, go to law school. If you were like me and wasn't with anybody, then by all means, this is the time to do it. Do it early. Law school scientists and engineers, they do not get good grades. Typically, they do not get good grades. And one of the reasons for that is that you get tested once per semester at the very end. So you're supposed to show up for class, listen, take notes. And there's, you know, no workbooks, none of this, none of that, no little tests. Just at the end, you write out everything that you know um, in, in uh, relation to these, these questions that the professor will ask. And that's, that's very hard to do when you're a scientist and engineer because you're used to workbooks and sample problems. Am I on the right track? Am I not? I get a TA to talk with. They're like, there's none of that. Or you don't know if you're doing well. And because it's only three years, you're, you're being tested six times, once at the end of every semester. So for you to, to figure out what you did wrong from that first semester, in that second semester, kind of get it right, and you, you start like iterating and getting a little bit better, it's, it's just too late, really. Um, I, some people do better. I was probably towards the average of scientists and engineers. You know, you don't do too well at first, but then do very well at the very end of sixth um, set of tests. And like mud, it's hard to get into good schools, just like an MBA. Oh, and then there's the bar exam. Not that this should be a, a real barrier to anybody, but my experience was I studied and studied and studied for the bar exam. I was the most, I, the, of, of all the people I knew, I was the most prepared for the bar exam. It's three days and it starts early in the morning and it goes to the afternoon. And even though I was very confident and knew everything on the test could do just fine, it was still a horrible experience or just a bad experience. Now the California bar exam is two days instead of three days. So at least you have that going for you. The pros, you meet a, a wide variety of incredibly talented people. Now they're bad at math or they say they're bad at math, but they're very, very ambitious and very talented, very cool people. Um, you learn all about business without going to business school. I used to say that getting a law degree was kind of like going and getting a business degree, but on steroids, because you're there three years instead of two, and you're learning all the background behind the businesses and why they're set up and the taxes and um, uh, evidence and that kind of thing. Maybe that's not so true because you're not learning all the finance stuff and certainly none of the calculus is in it. You learn how to advocate for yourself and you learn to advocate for yourself and others. It's a very powerful skill and 
you know, I, I don't think I would have done nearly as well as an engineer without Toastmasters and without Toastmasters, I probably wouldn't have gone into this. And so being able to advocate, speak on your feet, write, um, you know, very important. And you get to do that all the time in law school. You confront your fear of public speaking. Now there are people I went to law school with who hated public speaking and they never got over it, but they confronted their fears and they got through it and they were called on in class and um, had to go through all the, the professor's questions, but, um, and, and they did fine. They did just fine and they don't do any public speaking now. They confronted it. You're always employable. You're always needed. Whether you are in the middle of New York City or out in a hut in Alaska or somewhere in the South Pacific, some island, there's always a need for lawyers. You just hang up a shingle on the side of your, your, um, your hut. And as long as you're licensed to practice in that jurisdiction, you can practice law and you can make a living. You get respect from strangers. Go figure. I came from a family of school teachers. We hated lawyers. And to have people you know, walk up to you, when they learn you're a lawyer, they, they absolutely respect you, at least on the first bat. I, I do pro bono, and that is helping people for free as an attorney. And what I do is when people are being evicted from their, their uh, tenancy in San Francisco, I'm the one to go and argue on behalf of them with the landlord's, with the landlord's um, uh, attorney. And the landlord's attorney does this for a living all the time. They're very well paid. They do well. And I'll go in there and I'll argue. And, you know, I'm, you know, been doing it for a little while, but I'm minimally trained. I'm supervised. And um, I get so many compliments from people, from strangers that I'm helping. They say, oh, I could have never, done you were so good in there. Oh, that was so great. I can't believe that argument you came up with. And, um, so you, you kind of get that from people and that's very, very rewarding. At America pays attorneys way too much. And I'll, I'll put that on the pro side of this. So how do you get in? You get the best undergrades, undergrad grades you possibly can. There's nothing you can do, you're at mud. You study for the LSAT. So what I found was that about a third of your kind of score, if you're getting into law school, a third of it is you know, based on your undergrad grades. A third of it is on, on your undergrad grades. And your a two thirds is LSAT. And everything else is just kind of bumping that up and bumping that down. But that's kind of how I figured it. And, and then you have, you know, what bumped me up a little bit was, okay, I have a STEM degree. I'm a little bit older. Um, maybe that helped, maybe it didn't but I did well enough on the LSAT. Um, there was a question in our, our, our question packet uh, from people. And it was one of the questions was, uh, what could I do to prepare myself to go to, to law school or get an MBA? And I would say everyone should go and study and take the patent bar. It takes about three weeks you, it's full time. If you were to you know, buy study materials, you get a bunch of CDs, you get a booklet, you study it, study for about three weeks. And that booklet's, you know, expensive, like a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars. But, you know, I sold mine on eBay later for, you know, a small loss. And you study for that. And you'll always have that once you pass it, you'll always have that as a line item on your resume. And so that's good. If, even if you were to stay an engineer, I would recommend go be, go take the patent bar you'll technically be a patent agent. So if times got rough, you got laid off, you can always be a patent agent. We, we, our firm looks for patent agents. We've hired patent agents from Harvey Mudd. They're valuable. You're always gonna be hired. But when it comes time to, at least if you're applying for law school, you're gonna go into a different stack because no one else is, you know, who's applying to law school is going to have already passed a bar someplace, except for maybe international students. So you're going to go in a different sect. They're going to have to scratch their head. They're going to have to think about it. You, they, they say, oh, this person really is interested in law because they've already passed a bar someplace. And look at it. It's the patent bar. It's the you know, United States patent bar. Um, apply to top schools, take the best school over. I had free rides and, you know, Alfred and all that, but I, I was told, just go to the best school you can. I went to UCLA. 
the path afterwards. Well, what do you do? Like mud, people, my classmates, myself, I found we think differently. And think of yourself, you've gone to mud, you thought a certain way in high school, and then you go to mud and you think differently. You think about solving problems differently. And part of that is just, you know, you grew older and you matured. But the other part of it is there is something to be said for just being pressed your very hardest on technical subjects. And the same is true in law school. You're going to think a bit differently. Hopefully it doesn't wreck your relationships. Um, I, you know, here's my recommendations. Go be a lawyer for a few years, try it out. It's lucrative, um, but it demands a lot of time. You can't take long vacation and you have something called billable hours, which are awful. It means every 0.1 hours, every six minutes, you kind of have to account for that during the day. And that's just not a great way to live, but you know, you'll pay off your, your law school loans pretty quickly. I've found that, um, you get to meet the C-suite executives pretty quickly. You walk past all those cubicles full of accountants and engineers and you go straight to the C-suite and they want you in the room with them because you might have critical legal knowledge that they need, whether it's in tax law, patent law, whatever. And they also want that attorney-client privilege. So the attorney-client privilege means that anything that's said in the conversation is secret and it's the highest privilege there is. I mean, it's a greater privilege than you have with your spouse of keeping secrets. And so if you're in the room, if a lawyer is in the room, in a boardroom or whatever, you always have the argument. It might not, not be correct, but you always have the argument that this conversation might be protected because there's attorney-client privilege. And then after all that, I mean, if the big law works out or law works out, like, you know, good for you, that's great. You know, you, you've changed careers. But otherwise, go in-house, go work at one of those corporate jobs, work at Apple, work at Facebook, wherever, work at small, some small company. Go be an entrepreneur. You know business. You've been trained in it. You can go help those in need. There's so many people who can't afford lawyers that, um, I mean, the, it, it's, the, the world is open. There's so many people who need you. And you can go sit on boards of corporations and nonprofits and do all that. And you're always going to be a valuable resource for family and friends. You get asked to review paperwork. You get, you know, I get, hey, hey I have an invention. Want to hear about it? I get that all the time. And that's great. Um, family and friends, they're having you look at, you know, their wills. And, and I'm not a wills attorney, but I can certainly look at that and um, give honest advice. So I, I've been talking for a while. Russell, back to you. What are the, what do you think the similarities are? And you want to go through this slide? Yeah, well, let's go through it quick and then we'll uh, move on to the Q&A. So they're both expensive, as you, as you heard, two years versus three years. So I guess an MBA is cheaper that way. Um, and uh, some of the things that um, Mark said uh, apply to business too. Like you do get to uh, talk to C-level folks and you get to learn how to present yourself a little better. Um, and hey, you don't have to do an MBA to learn all about business, as uh, as he was talking about, or uh, or meet the C-suite. And if you're in consulting, you have to worry about the same billable hours that uh, that Mark was talking about. But I think more more of the business field, you don't have to worry about that than uh, than law. So that's us, Vanessa. Come back. And uh, what, we go through the ones we submitted and then we also have the ones folks typed in while we were talking. We do, so I'm actually gonna stop sharing really quick. Um, so there's been questions about GPAs. So how much does GPA matter when applying for business, business school or law school? But also, you know, most mothers do have, you know, low GPAs because of how rigorous the courses are. Do you have any advice for mothers with low by national standards? grades who apply to these programs. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take that one. Um, so even if you do have lower grades, you tend to do better on the either. There's also, just like there's an LSAT for law, there's a GMAT for business. And I think a lot of mud folks tend to score well on both of those, or at least the GMAT, because it is, or is it GMAT? Yeah, I think it's GMAT. It's been a while. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the one for business, uh, uh, it's easier to uh, score well, and you are a non-traditional 
uh, either a somewhat non-traditional for law, just having a STEM background or for business, it's useful. You know, a quantitative background for a lot of the finance and different fields is uh, something that's brought out. So there are some advantages, even despite whatever GPA you might have. Great, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about how easy or difficult it was? Uh, did you find the transition from engineering to business or law? Mark? Sure, that was very hard. Um, so when I sat in law school, the guy on my left was, uh, he had won international awards for his writing. The person on my left was an internet millionaire back when millionaire meant something. Um, and, and then all around the room, I mean, just amazing people. And I had not written a sentence, I think for a decade. I mean, a sentence with a capital letter at the beginning of period is all bullet points as an engineer. So um, that was, it was a reckoning. It was very difficult. Of course, I was excited to do it. So I was amped up and studied hard. Um, it's a different kind of hard for law school. It's not the math and science and that right, there's no right answer. It's really how to get to the answer and laying everything out. So, um, you know, on a scale of difficulty, you know, easy to, to difficult. Yeah, very difficult. Not as difficult on the business side. Great, thank you. Our next question. So what can a scientist do to prepare for law or business school? I know you've talked a little bit about it, but, and then also how can a scientist sell themselves as an applicant to a law or business program? I think on the science side, you know, so rather than just sort of a general uh, technical background, if you're specifically a scientist, I think you have to say something in your application about what what that equation equals. So scientist plus business or law degree equals what after you're a graduate. At least on the business side, you um, in my application, I spend a little bit of time saying, you know, and, and it's often one of the questions, what do you want to do with this degree? So how does a business and science degree help you? Are you going to go into management for, you know, Genentech or something like that? And you feel like, you know, having that science plus business skills uh, really helps you do that. Or where where is it you see building on your science background that's going? Um, I have one someone who joined a law firm out of mud and have been working as a patent engineer, uh, patent agent for five years now. Um, now I plan to go to a law school. What interesting law courses would you recommend to a mudder who already knows about patent law? Interesting law courses. So those are some of them that I, you know, I put up on the board. I would, um, if you're going to law school, um, sign up for something called Barbary. B-A-R-B-R-I, and you almost have to take it anyway at the end. I mean, it's thousands of dollars you have to sign up for this course, but it trains you for the bar. And typically people sign up, you know, when they graduate, they go and sign up for Barbary, and then they train you how to like actually pass the bar exam because nothing in law school is really going to help you do that. I, I would say, um, so I signed up for it a little bit early, but not too early, not early enough, I would say. I would sign up for that right away. I mean, before even taking my very first class in law school, because what they will do is teach you all about I don't know, contracts. And here are the, the three things that a contract needs. And so the professor will get up there, he'll you know, lecture for all semester, and then you'll be presented with this test. And the test is going to be on what are those three things that are needed for a contract? And you'll, I think you'll do a lot better for that. It's, that's not going to help admissions, but it's just going to prepare you for free for, for uh, law school. Great. Thank you. Um, so in the Claremont College's context, what are some of the things one is able to do with an MBA degree that they would not be able to do otherwise? How much value would you attach to the MBA experience and upside in order to justify the cost of attending? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a philosophical question you have to have about your life. So here, here's the trade-off I would give you. Are you really focused on just getting to the, you know, the, the, the basic mechanics that you need in order to be able to do a task? If so, if you're sort of that cut to the chase, just what's my, you know, how do, how do I get to this answer? You probably don't need an MBA. You know, you can just brute force your way 
through business. I mean, there's plenty of people in business who don't have MBAs, but if you're interested in exploring more about business issues, if you have a long-term need to dominate a corporation, uh, it's a, uh, it's helpful to lay the groundwork for that. You know, I found that early on, um, a lot of my peers in business didn't have MBAs, but as I rose through the ranks, more and more of them did. So, you know, it's kind of what you want out of, out of life. You know, if you want to not worry about debt, have that stressed out for you, you know, you can skip it in clear conscience. You can, you can study a lot of the materials on the side, just through free courses. You can learn about economics or accounting, any of the mechanics of things that you learn, but you're not going to get that, that, you know, dialogue with other interest, you know, just to what Mark was saying about the interesting people you meet, you meet a lot of interesting people with the MBA too. And they're they're since they're from different walks of life than you've seen at mud or in a, in a technical field, uh, you know, you, you explore and broaden a little more. So, so it's a little bit of, uh, about what you're really trying to get out of your career. Thank you. Um, can one get into one of the best business schools directly after mud? Is that possible? Um, at Stanford, for example, there are a few people every year who go directly to a good business school, but most of them tend to, uh, the average is that you do do two to four years of work experience. And it, it helps you because even if you can get in directly, um, you're not going to have as much to contribute to those case discussions because you haven't had much business experience yourself. So uh, when, you know, you're having those dark and stormy night cases uh, where you're asking, like, should we do this new product or not? You know, you can draw on your own experience. Well, the last couple of years when I've been working, here's what's, you know, worked for me. And you, you'll, you, you know, you might have a few summer jobs, but you're not, you, it's not as rich of a thing. So I would say, don't, you don't need to gun for it. You know, it's fine to wait a few years for it. And, and it might help you decide whether or not you really want one anyway. Um, so with a follow-up on graduate schools, are graduate schools interested in having HSC students or they don't really know about its quality, especially in the East Coast? Do you have any thoughts on that? What do you think, Mark? I've never heard of us. Um, there's, there, you know, some professors have. Um, admissions people, I'm not quite sure. We're, um, Harvey Mudd is now double the size that it was when we went. So we have, you know, double the percentage chance. The people who do, who have heard of Harvey Mudd, respect it very, very well. Um, probably the best compliments I get are from, that I've gotten from an MIT grad and from separately from a Caltech grad. He kind of turned to me and said, oh man, you guys are nerds. And that's from MIT and Caltech. So there's, there's some respect there. Yeah, I would. I was the only one from Mud from my year, and I think from like a year or two after, you know, since it is a, a smaller school and this isn't something that a lot of people do from the school. You know, the most common undergrad for from my classmates was Princeton, followed by like Harvard and Stanford, you know, sort of more traditional rounded uh, schools. But doesn't mean you can't do it or that, you know, occasional person would know. Great, thank you. Um, is a single company career not advisable anymore? It seems we'll jump around every five to seven years as you're suggesting earlier. Never work for a single company. Don't do it. I'm kidding. Uh, I think, I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't think, I, I think in the Bay Area, it certainly seems like people do jump around. But I mean, I've known folks that have worked at the same company their, you know, their whole career to date. And it makes them really knowledgeable about uh, all different aspects of of uh, that business. So I wouldn't I wouldn't base your staying or going just based on how many years. Except I guess Mark, that's what you were saying. <laughs> you should do. Opposite, so maybe so. Advice. Yeah. So counterpoint oh. is Mark. <laughs> the only company you should stay with is the one that you found. And I, that may or may not be a quote from Gary Evans. Uh, and then, but then you should leave as soon as it gets bought and you vested, then leave and start something else. So, uh, you know, uh, there's, uh, there's something to be said for, you know, that guy I, I talked about who, who just left, who just up and quit and, and refreshed himself. But you know what? I think he's been with whatever companies he's with now, Lockheed Martin for 20 years. Great. Um, so 
question from one of your peers. What was with the class of 94 choosing MBA and law degrees? We're just a sexy group of people. You know, there's this guy named Greg Har who did way better than us. You know, he wasn't available for uh, the, uh, the, the video portion of this chat, but you should look him up. Two word answer and that I already said Gary Evans. <laughs> That's why. Um, so one of our last questions, would you ever consider returning to engineering? And if so, what would that look like? Do you want to do that? I can, uh, I can take it. Why don't you start? Okay. So you can, um, back when I was an engineer, the people that would be engineering managers were the people that were good engineers not people that were good at managers. So you take a good engineer who likes engineering and you make them a manager, they don't get to do the engineering anymore and they may not know about management. So returning to engineering is terrific, especially if like from, a, from the MBA side, especially if you're in management because you understand it and presumably you don't mind managing then and then you can let the good engineers be good engineers and you can manage them. I had the conversation with um you know, my colleagues and peers, uh, associates here, would we go back to engineering if we could? And the answer is, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm sure I could walk down the hallway and they'd all say, oh yeah, I'd go back in a heartbeat. But it, you know, it doesn't pay the same amount as, as what we get now. And you know, the grass is always greener too. Would I really go back? I wouldn't go back to work for, you know, in the same capacity that I did before. I'd wanna be, in charge, you know, the owner or, you know, part of the uh, a CTO or, or some, somebody that can direct the company. I don't want to be a cog in a large machine anymore. Now that I've got a taste for, you know, all these different companies and all the different ways they work and what works and what doesn't. And, um, you know, I want to, I want to help out. Well, thank you, both of you. Um, we have about a minute left. Do you have any last remarks you want to tell our audience before I close? We appreciate your time. We hope this was helpful. Uh, if anybody has any follow-on questions, feel free to let Vanessa know, and I'm sure she can forward them to us. I appreciate talking a lot. Thank you. Neither of us rides a unicycle, by the way. So... You can add that in your business school or law school essay if it applies to you to offset the grades. <laughs> well, I want to thank our speakers, Russell and Mark, for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge and insights with us. Thank you to our audience for your questions and for attending this event. We will follow up in within the next week with a recorded video and any presentation material. This concludes our Mud Talks programming for 2021. In 2022, we have Just Culture Management Lessons from the Aviation Industry with Peter Tomestri, class of 89, on Thursday, January 20th at 12 p.m. Pacific time. If you are interested in being a Mud Talk speaker, please contact, contact us at alumni at hmc.edu. Alumni, please join members of our Alumni Association Board of Governors, ABOG, for HMC Founders Day Happy Hour on Tuesday, December 14th from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific time. Feel free to attend as your schedule permits. Future events can be found on our website by visiting alumni.hmc.edu. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Have a great night.